right, good afternoon. It is 3.05 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. I am Councilman John Bullock of the 9th District, uh, Chair of the Finance and Performance Committee. Uh, we are also joined by Councilmember Odette Ramos of the 14th District, uh, staff to the committee, Mark Reed Curran. Uh, we also have representatives um, from the mayor's office as well. I expect also the council president's office. And uh, the subject matter for the day is the mayor's office of homeless services. So we do have Director Simmons before us today, and glad to have you. Um, and I'm sure there'll be other representatives as well, just to go over um, the first quarter financial performance for FY uh, 2025, and then also look at the programmatic activities, accomplishments, issues, and any challenges. So we don't want to belabor the point, but thank you for joining us today. And I believe you have a presentation, so uh, we'll get that um, up and ready for you, and we can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Yes, please. And as you're doing that, one, one of the points I do want to make, and I'm joined by my son George as well, but we were talking, he asked me what was the subject matter for today, and we talked about the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services and the fact that there are so many of our uh, people who are unhoused and the important work that you do. So again, we really do appreciate you being here today and walking us through what you're, what you're up to. All right, thank you both very much. It's been a year, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about what his life looked like for MOHS one year later. Um, this PowerPoint presentation was prepared to, to kind of give a comprehensive view of what we're doing for homeless services, as well as to kind of lay in some of the foundation surrounding uh, some of the grants that we're managing, as well as the progress that we've just made overall over the past year. I've promised that I was going to go through these slides rather quickly, so I'll, I'll do my best. Next slide. This is an overall of who we are at MOHS and who we serve. Our program components are broken down into street outreach, coordinated access, emergency services, HOPWA, PSH, rapid rehousing, YHDP, and HMIS. Overall, we manage about $60 million annually to support the programs and services by the city of Baltimore. Next. Today I plan to, to go through quite an aggressive agenda, I recognize. Um, this looks like talking about funding sources, our grant administration. What brought us here today was talking about our organizational updates and the progress that we've made, as well as talking about the financial status of our organization, and talking about Code Blue, some key initiatives, and just some items that we would like to just point out for our year in review. Next slide. Next slide. MOHS, we administer about 150 contracts a year. What this slide is breaking down is the different sources of these funds and what they help us to do. Continuum of care, it allows us to serve well over 1,000 households with permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing program. We look at our ESG grants when you talk about um, shelter and you talk about outreach services. Our emergency shelter grants is what enables us to do that. General funds is our largest source for how do we pay for emergency shelters. The city awards MOHS $15.2 million on an annual basis and we've spent about $10.2 million of that on emergency shelters and the other $2.6 million on the outreach services. Next slide. A year ago, we talked about the need for MOHS to look at our internal structure, our fiscal team, our compliance team. Most of us was very new, including the person that's sitting here today. Uh, and so this is lifting up some of what we've been able to accomplish over the last year with the support of a lot of human beings, and that includes the MOH staff, as well as HUD, who has been tremendous in providing our office with technical assistance. So what this has looked like for us is creating standard operating procedures for our compliance and fiscal teams. We've also been able to create standardized written standards for our COC and ESG programs. 
What I'm going to lift up is the importance of that and what that means for our community. Um, MOHS serves as the collaborative applicant for the city of Baltimore. So we serve at the pleasure of the COC um, for our rental assistance and rapid rehousing and supportive services programs. I mean, what that community have been able to do is just establish standard operating procedures for those programs. It, it allows our community to have baseline expectations, but it also allows MOHS to know how we need to show up to ensure compliance for the city of Baltimore in that program that we're charged with serving. The other item that we've been able to just kind of lift up in terms of policies and procedures is our fiscal team has done a, a lot of work just in terms of staffing, understanding the compliance regarding the programs that we're charged to serve. Um, and that that is difficult because the first the first slide lifted up the different funding streams that comes through MOHS, and each one of those grants have different requirements that our program compliance team, as well as our fiscal team, is responsible for knowing, understanding, but interpreting in a real way that we can provide real service. So I'm pretty proud of the work that, that our agency has been able to do in those regards. And the last one is HUD funding. We have been able to receive an unprecedented request of having the $6 million return from, from HUD. Um, that was in partnership with HUD came out and they did a lot of work with our office, but they took a look at what is it that we really do for the city of Baltimore. So all of the funds that we, we spent through city general funds, we had returned. Next slide. One of the items that we talked about is, are we doing better with making timely payments to our providers through the work of not just MOHS, but the Department of Finance? I want to lift up again through the Department of Finance. They've been able to help us to streamline some of our systems and some of our process that has enabled us to make timely payments to our providers. And so what that's looked like for us is 85% of our providers have been paid on time. What we've done is it, just a graph of a chart, just a comparison of 2022 versus 2020, 2023 versus 2024, so you can get a sense as to what's going out the door from MOHS to our subrecipients and our providers. And you'll, you're able to look at the years and the differences and just what we're doing in terms of making payments. But the other line of that is, We've been working with our providers because this is a compliance-driven space. You get paid and reimbursed based on what MOHS is able to show that we are able to pay you out for. So not only is this the work of MOHS, this is also the work of our partners and our providers of working alongside us so we can submit uh, payments in a timely fashion but also with the work of the Department of Finance because it is pretty complex of figuring out how to move so many dollars um, to so many subrecipients on a monthly basis. So thank you to the Department of Finance for that work with MOHS. Sorry, not to drop one quick question. I'm looking at the spike in November and December and January. Is that related to the cold weather months or is that just something cyclical that we, that we should be thinking about? Just curious, that's all. No, it's a great question. That's when I arrived, and that was us doing a lot of work of looking at who we owed and what was behind and doing the work with the Department of Finance in order to make the payments. So the comparison in the yellow is the 10-1-2023 to 9-30-2023 versus 10-1-2023 through 9 2024 So that initial spike that you're seeing is, is really related to back payments and really I'm getting a better sense as to who we owe from providers and doing that work um, in order to reconcile quite a bit of accounts. No problem. Next slide. I'm going to do my best not to be a data nerd and get it. So if by all means, lift up your hand and say, like, please don't, and I promise to stop. Next screen. I really think it's important for us to know what systems performance measures are for the city of Baltimore. It allows us to be able to see what 
are we grading ourselves on and how are we really serving those that are experiencing homelessness? Um, what systems performance measures does is someone said to me, are you on a three-year plan? MOHS works on a one-year plan. Every year we get to see our wins or we get to see if we're failing and missing our community. What systems performance measures does is HUD in every single community, our year is 10-1 through 9-30. And so what you're looking at is from 2019 to 2023, what have we done in each of the areas that HUD determines? The first area is looking at the length of time. Is your community doing a good job at decreasing the amount of time that people are spending homeless? You, I can't quite see, but hopefully you can. Um, what this is looking at is in 2023, the decline in the amount of time that people are spending homeless. I'm gonna jump over to the system performance measure three. What systems performance measures three is looking at is how many people are in your system that this is the very first time that they've entered into your system. For that period of time, you can see that we are seeing more people experiencing homelessness for the first time in the city of Baltimore. The other measure that I'll point out for this group is going to be measure seven. That measure is taking a look at who are you housing that's coming from the street. The line that you're seeing on the top is we did a comparison to other COCs across the United States. Where are we measuring at in comparison to other communities? There are roughly 400 COCs. And so we just did an aggregate of their data. For the most part, you're able to see the city of Baltimore is doing pretty well. The space that we are not doing as well as we aim to do is in street outreach. We're not exiting people from the street into housing. And so when you look at the, the graph, um, that is very clear as you look at our trends over the last three years and what other communities are able to do. The last measure looks at housing retention, system performance measure seven. That's looking at as you're exiting people into housing, are they staying housed? This community has done extremely well in that space. When someone is exiting the housing to permanent supportive housing, they're not returning into our system. And so as you can see, that's, a, that's an area that this city has been consistently doing well in. Next slide. Most of us are very familiar. I, I am sure you do. <laughs> Most of us are very familiar with the point in time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just have a couple questions. Um, this is very helpful in terms of a dashboard for us. Um, so I really appreciate you and your staff, you know, having to do all that research relative to other cities and stuff. That was, I'm sure, not easy. Uh, but this is great, okay, for us to get a sense of where we are. But it's also, as you said, if we're looking at uh, SMP 7A, where the national average is that folks are actually leaving homelessness into um, housing is better than what we're doing, right? You said that directly. And I just in working with you with, in several instances that we have in my district, I can guess why that is. Um, and that doesn't it brings me to my point around some of this is not necessarily, some of these data are not necessarily gonna be reflective on you or the, your agency because there's other factors. And so hopefully you're able to, when you're looking at this and presenting this to others to say, here's the factors that's going on here relative to why we're not able to get folks in. It, it's not that you're not out there, your teams are out there, they're engaging, they're building trust. Um, we have a lot of other, uh, our residents are actually doing pretty bad and they have lots of other challenges that they're dealing with where housing could really help them, but that's not where their headspace is right now. Um, and I can say a lot more about that. But anyway, I just wanted to say, you know, talk a little bit about that part, but also that this is very helpful and this is gonna be a year by year snapshot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can also take a look each year at these and just see how we're doing. But again, some of this is not on you. It's just some of the other factors that we're dealing with. So many other factors. And when you look at street outreach and the lack of funding that goes into street outreach, um, there lies the answer. We have not invested in street outreach. For the most part, general funds is the only space that heavily supports that work. 
And so as we continue to look at slides and we look at street outreach, shelters being at capacity, all of these are factors, right? All of these are factors that um, is indicative of that, of that data point. Next. Point in time count. Um, most of us are very familiar with the point in time count. What I've put on the screen is 2023 data. And in what I'm going to move over to shortly is the 2024. But in 2023, we was able to see 16% of those that were in our system was chronically homeless. 8% was veterans. 17% was youth between the ages of 18 and 24. This is also laying out what else are we seeing in our system? What percentage are those that are in our system that are also dealing with serious mental illness, that are dealing with substance abuse? So you're looking at the breakout of that as well as the line item for the age demographic for it. Next slide. We wanted to break out the age groups of the sheltered, unsheltered, and the demographics for who we have served in a point of time count just a little bit more context about point in time count. Um, it's two different counts that happened in 2023. It's the sheltered count and the unsheltered count. So for our unsheltered count, the number was about 113 people was counted as the unsheltered count. And a 1,438 of that was those that are in shelter and that's emergency shelter, transitional housing, by the transitional shelter and safe haven are considered the locations that's a, a part of that. Next slide. We're showing some preliminary data for 2024. This is not final data, this is preliminary data for 2024. What we're able to see though that I'm gonna point out is we did not do an unsheltered count in 2024. It was not a requirement of communities to have an unsheltered count. However, HUD did require a sheltered count. What I'm looking at in particular is the increase in those that are chronically homeless that's a part of our system in 2024. We have an increase in those that are chronically homeless. We're seeing an increase in veterans in our system. So although in some spaces we're doing much better um, having less people that are in shelter on that particular one day, as we continue to go through the slides, it provides a more comprehensive picture of what our system is looking like. But over the last, since 2019, as I look back at it, this community has done better. Every single year, there's been a decrease in those that are sheltered. There's been a decrease in the housing inventory count for people that's experiencing homelessness. So we've, we've made strides in the right direction as a community in those two spaces consistently since 2019. Next slide. Next slide. This slide is taking a look at a, a longitudinal systems analysis for permanent housing. So what I'm going to say is we've had an increase in permanent housing in 2024. Um, the top of this is looking at how many households did we serve in housing in 2023. You'll see 4,801. Um, total clients served and looking at the number of households. This is also talking to us about the length of time that clients are spending homeless before they are becoming housed. When we look at the data from 2023 to 2024, we were able to serve more clients with housing in 2024. And the length of time has also decreased in 2024. But that's largely accumulated to, attributed to HABC and our partnership with HABC of adding additional housing units into our system for those that are dedicated to experiencing homelessness. So the additional households is a reflection of that number. Next slide. What we're looking at is a massive data sheet that is really talking about our shelter system and our street outreach teams. Um, at the bottom, you're looking at a comparison of 2023 versus 2024. This year from 10-1-2023 through 9 2024 we have had 7,800, and I believe that says 89 people in our system. So our emergency shelters have served 1,226 unduplicated clients, and you're looking at the breakdown of the ages of those that are in our system. The next one that says emergency shelter night by night, 
2,275 people. When night by night is, is in winter shelter. In winter shelter, we promise that we're going to make sure we have a space available for everyone when it is just too cold outside. And so that is what winter shelter looked like last season. The final number you're looking at is street outreach. How many people did our street outreach team encounter over the last year? They encountered well over 4,000 people. That's who our teams are serving. Next slide. This is a further breakdown of a comparison just between our shelters and night by night and where we was last year versus where we are this year. You're able to see the increase in each of the spaces from emergency shelter in 2023 versus 2024, an increase in beds and an increase in shelter night by night and an increase in street outreach. So we are continuous to see in every space of who we serve more need in our system. Next slide. Next. We launched the encampment protocol in 2024. It had a soft launch in 2023, but it officially in 2024, and also some improvements. So I'm gonna walk a little bit through some of the data is looking like through the encampment protocol. Next slide. As most of us know, we, we have two different approaches to the encampment. We have our standardized response, which looks like people call in and we, our street outreach teams respond. We typically respond the first day. This is saying five business days, but our team, um, once we receive the 311 calls, we are responding to clients, we're offering services, we're offering resources, and they are engaging people at a very high level. And then we have the strategic approach, which is about encampment resolutions. Next slide. There's been some pros and some cons to our, our, our encampment protocol. We've been able to learn um, from this protocol over the last year or so. What we've seen as some of the, the strengths is we're, we're guaranteeing shelter in the outreach as at the resolution, but we continue to have clients that decline um, and that that's going to be a part of our system. Next slide. What you're looking at is just the outcomes for the encampment protocols. Thus far, we've done 22 resolutions serving 104 individuals. What I'd like to lift up for the, those outreach teams and all of the members of the encampment resolution work group, um, they've been able to get 82% of the clients that they engage from these resolutions in the shelter. That is not a norm in our shelter system from street outreach. Um, getting 82% to connect to shelter is, is nothing other than engagement, engagement, engagement over a sustained period of time. So just wanna thank those outreach teams and those workers because that's not an easy thing to do. Um, I've shared often that those that are on the street engaged are not in our system for housing intervention. What you're looking at on the screen is how many of these people are now connected to a coordinated access packet, which really is the beginning of a housing intervention. Those that are coming through this encampment resolution, they've been successful in getting 68% of those clients in our system for a real life housing intervention. So just thank you very much to the outreach teams across the board for that work. Next. We are right at winter shelter. This is the season in MOHS. Uh, our winter shelter season begins November 1st and goes through March 31st. We activate winter shelter when the temperature is below 32 degrees. Next slide. This year, we've, we've activated quite a few sites for, for winter shelter, but again, we don't turn anyone away for winter shelter. As such, as the need continues to come, we will activate additional sites if they're needed. Um, I wanna say thank you to Director Moore and the BCRP team because they are critical in our winter shelter in helping us to identify sites as well as sharing some gratitude to the DGS team because they are also, um, I don't think what most people realize is they help us to be able to set these sites, transport costs and transport beds, um, which is not an easy thing to do because you're going by the weather. So it's an unpredictable item for our community as a whole, um, but people have been extremely responsive. 
Our plan this year is to use the Fairfield Inn for single families, for single women rather, and McVet is going to be for men. We are using Weinberg for single families. Robert C. Marshall is going to be an overflow location and Louis T. Mari is also going to be an overflow location. And we also have two additional sites that's been um, provided to us by BCRP if we need to activate them as well. Next slide. For Winter Shelter, we also contract with an organization that's going to provide transportation. What you're looking at is the different pickup and drop off locations for Winter Shelter. It's almost like a bus. I mean, it has bus stops and people go to the bus stops and they're transported to the location that they're gonna be assigned to for Winter Shelter. Next. Housing navigation. One of the things to mention about Winter Shelter is it really is just for sleep. There are no case management, there are no services that are a part of Winter Shelter. What we're focused on is making sure that people have a safe, warm space to sleep. And so what we're lifting up and we've added onto the list is where can people go for navigation in addition to case management and support. These are the sites that currently have MOHS navigators associated with those sites. And so people will also be able to go to those locations to get navigated, to get additional resources, and to get additional support. Next slide. We're also activating warming centers. I, I don't wanna say me, our community is activating warming centers. And so thank you to the organizations that you see on this list. What they've done is they opened up their facilities to ensure during the day people have a warm space to go. Um, and, and so what you're looking at is those organizations. So thank you to them for their continued um, allowing us to use, utilize their space for warming spaces through the winter months. Next slide. We're lifting up with some of the key initiatives and goals have been for, for MOHS this year um, through the partnership with uh, quite a few agencies that I, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time of giving some things to if that's okay. Um, the ARPA office has in Elizabeth and Shamaya have been wonderful human beings in order to work with as you are entering a very new space. A lot of these programs, um, they was able to work alongside us as we got them launched with me getting here. The first program looks like this rapid rehousing program. That program was able to serve 126 households with 86% of them remaining housed. The second project was a shelter diversion fund. There was no diversion program at MOHS before this fund. And so what you're looking at here is how many individuals did we stop from needing to be a part of all of the other slides, right? So this is 265 unique households that were served with flex funds that prevented these households from becoming homeless and needing to go into our shelter system. The next one that you're looking at is the Housing Accelerator Fund in partnership with Commissioner Kennedy, who has also been a godsend for me as I've come into this space. Um, we've been able to launch the Housing Accelerator Fund. What that project has done is it's added 139 permanent supportive housing units into our ecosystem, 151 units that are affordable housing units. And a couple of the other projects that we've launched uh, is 20 additional units through the Supportive Housing Institute pipeline. And here's an, so that is giving us a potential 310 units that will become a part of our atmosphere in the upcoming years as a result of this project. Next slide. Staying in alignment with supportive housing projects in partnership with DHCD State, I'm gonna say DHCD State, Danielle Meister and Secretary Day's office we, in HABC, we've been able to get a site that's called Restoration Gardens Number One. That site is a youth dedicated site. However, we've been able to use $500,000 of ARPA dollars in working alongside Baltimore City DSS and HABC for that building to now become focused on prioritizing youth that's aging out of foster care. That's going to be a, a very good opportunity um, just for some of our youth that ordinarily would not have had this option. They're now going to be prioritized for that site. The next item that, that I'm grateful for is with HABC, we've been able to add an additional 36 units, but those units are dedicated towards families. So those are families that are now going to have a safe space to go and call home as a result of that partnership with HABC. 
And then the last one that we were just excited about is this ACES Medicaid pilot program. Um, what the Medicaid ACES pilot program does is it allows for a waiver for case management services and support. What our community has done as a little bit unique is we've paired that case management support with HABC units. And so what that means for an individual is you're able to take someone that is chronically homeless and you're offering them home as well as case management and supportive services. And Healthcare for the Homeless is our partner, is our service partner in that regard. Next slide. We've recently purchased the two hotels that we will continue to use as emergency shelter. Um, that RFP has been won by Sojourner, by EHC and Healthcare for the Homeless. I'm excited about what that future is going to bring for that site. Um, their ultimate goal is to create 155 permanent supportive housing units, and their vision is a medical respite center. What Baltimore City does not have is a medical respite center that's dedicated towards those that are experiencing homelessness. So in one of the earlier slides, I, sh I shared what our seniors, how many seniors are in our system. Roughly 35% of those that were on the slides are seniors that are entering our system. We are not prepared for what some of their medical issues are going to look like, and I think that this project is going to allow space for people that need some medical care, and it's a respite. So right now, if you're not able to take care of your activities of daily living, you cannot stay in a shelter. So as we think about seniors, this is a vision that's going to allow seniors to be able to be seniors and to be able to be connected to housing, get support, medical care, and then go back home. And the final item that we have here is just additional housing. We're, we're, we're looking, someone said, I'm just trying to accumulate housing units. I really am just trying to accumulate housing units because our need is just that great. Next slide. What's the vision for MOHS over the next, I, I live my life in quarters, so the next two quarters, the hope is, um, we're gonna do a lot of work with EHC on their, on their conversion for these two hotels. We're currently applying for an application, a federal application that's called COC Builds. It has a potential for about 7.5 million that's going to be put into the renovation of the construction of that location. The other item is that operating is always going to be a challenge when you're having a permanent supportive housing program. We're working very closely with HABC on how can we put vouchers in this building and what can that potentially look like. Um, other, other than that, operating would be extremely tough for a building of that size and magnitude without the work in a partnership with HABC. The other item is the state, DHCD state has awarded MOHS $2 million in bonus funds. We plan to use those bonus funds to help us with those that are on the street that are chronically homeless, as well as to help us to create some additional opportunities for those that are experiencing homelessness for the first time. Um, I'm, in, I'm very intentional about the ultimate goal of creating 800 shelter beds. Right now, we're currently using these two hotels as shelter, it's emergency shelter. We anticipate being able to use these two spaces through 2026 as this organization continues to work on their financial package for this building before construction is going to begin. At the same time, the city of Baltimore is working to secure some additional permanent shelter spaces for families. That concludes my presentation, I believe. Next slide. I could have said thank you. I apologize mm. for that. I should have had a thank you slide. Mm. Well, thank you uh, for being so detailed and, and going through all this and writing the ship. I will say, um, back to the first question and answer, again, paying back all those uh, uh, vendors and all those, those partners. Um, I, how difficult was that a process? I mean, was it trying to find out who was owed? I mean, can you just walk us through that? I'm, I'm just curious. Oh, they find you, sir. I think every everyone everyone has found a way. I think when I first got here, what was overwhelming in, in a good way was the amount of people that just wanted to figure out, well, how can I help? How can I help? And what that looked like was a very full calendar and an executive assistant that has been very intentional on me getting to know the community. And so for us, our COC 
has been a great partner for us. Um, and what that relationship has done is they help us, MOHS, to fully understand what are the needs in the community, and then we have to step up and meet the needs of the community. But as I got a chance to work with the ARPA office and with DHCD and Commissioner Kennedy and Janet Abrahams, those were everyday calls for a couple of months of, of me being able to say what some of my challenges are and them being able to brainstorm solutions with me. And that was the same with, with Laura Larson and CAO Leach. It was, it's been a community of rounding themselves around and trying to figure out um, how can we help support MOHS, which I'm, I'm grateful for. And then also want to um, double back to one of the most glaring issues that we had um, in our city was the $6 million. Um, and again, just the, the level of homelessness that we're dealing with, that potential loss of funds was something that alarmed a lot of us. We're very pleased that that, that money came back. Um, but can you talk about, well, two things. One, um, that process and what that entailed, um, but then also the lessons learned. Because I know you know you talked about you know having the compliance and the fiscal team and the written standards and all that, but can you talk about some lessons learned, the process, and then also how we're able to get through that. Yes, yeah, so for us, that, that process started off with meetings at least three to four times a week with HUD of them getting to learn and understand MOHS's systems, our finance system. They also had to understand what it looked like from a provider's lens as well. So the first couple of months, um, I think when I got here, we had quite a few um, monitorings that needed to be closed out. So when you take a look at the monitoring reports, the items that MOHS needed to close out, when you have an opportunity, I think for me, I looked at this as an opportunity for me to fully understand our system and for our private providers to understand what MOHS is challenged with. And so we worked with HUD on a very, very regular basis and we pulled every single client record um, that was required, every single document that was required. And it was a lot of digging, a lot of looking. Um, the, the biggest component, I think, for all systems to understand is federal dollars are highly regulated and eligibility matters more than anything else. Eligibility matters more than anything else. And I think some, there are some points in time, if you have someone across from you and your immediate desire is to make sure this person is not experiencing homelessness, there is no rush to this process you have to go through the process. And I think that that is the biggest lesson that not only our teams have learned, but our providers have learned as well of there's no shortcuts to compliance when you're dealing with federal dollars. And so I was very proud that our community was able to show HUD that yes, we have been compliant, we have been following these policies and procedures, but what we didn't do was have it as organized as it needed to be. It wasn't as streamlined as it needed to be. So as such, um, you, you needed to organize it. You needed to meet with every single provider. And the way that HUD was able to do this monitoring for us, it was in different sections. It was not at one po point in time. Um, they monitored not just MOHS, they monitored our sub-recipients, they monitored our COC, and so they did a comprehensive look um, at all aspects, including how the city manages dollars and what does that flow look like when MOHS requests for reimbursement. So all areas of our system was assessed. The major lessons learned for us and as a community is compliance has to drive all decisions. We have to understand the data, we have to understand the people, um, and that has, to, that has to matter, it has to come first. Um, and so as a result, we learned that the city and our providers had been doing the things that we needed to do. The difference is we was not doing it in a streamlined way where anybody can come out and just take a look and find it. So it took us almost a year to compile all of that information. It took us a year to develop policies and procedures that HUD was able to say, we understand your vision. We understand how you're going to maintain this. Ramos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you also, Director, for all you've done. I think um, taking the uh, agency from A to B has been, uh, I think it's been great to see how you've been doing it and then it's methodical and thoughtful with a vision. Um, and you know, you said it yourself, you know, we ultimately we have to comply, we have to help people and we need more units. 
<laughs> and that is the goal, to get everybody through that process. So I know that there's still a lot of work to do in that regard. Um, so, so back on the hotels, I'm, again, grateful for um, the ARPA money to allow us to purchase that, um, the two hotels, plus the land. Like, there's some potential there for at least two more buildings, um, which I don't know. I have not spoken with HCH, so I don't know if that's in their vision, but it should be. And um, so what it, it has also been a godsend to have non-congregate shelter. Uh, again, that kind of came out, uh, came about during COVID when people were needing to go to the COVID hotel to not uh, be making everybody else sick or getting sick themselves. And uh, people kept telling me they liked the non congregate shelter, the city provided it and continues to provide it. So once these hotels uh, transfer to be housing, which I agree with, um, how are we going to be able to still provide um, non-congregate shelter? Are we going to be leasing from current hotels? Are we going to be purchasing new hotels? How does that, how's that going to work? Two, two things, HCH and EHC vision is the medical suite. So the lot that you're referring to, their, their vision is to build the medical suite on that. Um, oh, that was what you were calling for the respite. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's that's the most exciting part about their project to me. Don't I, well now they know that that is that that is a very exciting part of their project for me. I think that our vision is to have a, a system that is emergency shelter that's not not all relying on non congregate space, but we're looking at. Um, shared space that can look like a roommate instead of having a full congregate model. One of the items that we, we want to be careful about is our shelter system was starting to feel like housing for many. And so part of we, what we have to do is make sure we have a balance that our emergency shelter system is being used to move people to the next item. So we're not looking to replace hotels with people having single room occupancy. What we're looking to do is, is being able to buy some space, lease some space, a combination of the two, that's at least going to allow for two people to a room, that's going to allow for some space, that's your space. But it is going to look different from what the model that we've had when we had COVID. What, what about for, uh, we, we know that there are children uh, and families and single mothers that won't go into a space if they don't have privacy. And so they will stay on that street um, because they feel more safe. So that, that's my worry if we're gonna move from the current model that we have. But it sounds like you're trying to get enough spaces to be able to be flexible, right? So that certainly it might be a roommate situation if it's two single people. Um, or a couple, frankly. Um, but if it's a family to have at least something there, is that kind of what you're thinking about? That's it exactly. So families would not share space, that families would have their own rooms and their own spaces. And the same for couples. We would not put couples in a, in a space with another couple. But when we're looking at spaces that are dedicated towards women, spaces that are dedicated towards men, we're looking for those spaces to have doubles. But for families, we're not looking to mix families with other families at all, and we're not looking to mix couples with other couples. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So, so then you're, but you're still looking for what those spaces are going to be, and it looks like, and you have, basically a year um, or two, depending, um, to to kind of come up with what those solutions would be. Because what I, again, what I don't want to have happen is that people not go into shelter because they're afraid that they're going to go into a, you know, a congregate shelter space. Yes, ab absolutely. Our our vision is as we're looking at these two moving over, we're actively, and thank you very much to the Department of Real Estate and Eric and Tony and Matt, we're looking for spaces that's going to fully accommodate our needs. But part of what we're also looking for is making sure our shelter locations have a comprehensive model and not just shelter space. So we're looking to make sure that we can have workforce development on site. We can have social workers on that site. That totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. 
and, and also in other places around the city, so it's not so hard for people to get to. Are you also looking at that? We are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to that point about other areas, you teed me up perfectly, perfect, uh, perfectly and purposefully. So I will say, uh, Councilmember Ramos and I tend to be in similar meetings together, and I'm thinking about our meeting um, in terms of school portfolio. And it also leads me to the use, utilization of school buildings. And so we know um, there have been some challenges uh, as it relates to uh, dealing with communities, but also the space itself. Um, can you talk about um, your vision about, one, going to different parts of the city, but also what role that potential schools play in that process and how you communicate with neighborhoods in, in that effort? Well, so, so far, I haven't had much luck with the surplus schools um, because of the condition of the surplus schools. So they really have not been an option for us as it relates to permanent shelter space. But as we're looking at different locations, we visited about maybe 10 to 15 different sites over the last year. So I don't want anybody to think that I haven't been looking for spaces. We've been looking for spaces. Um, as we find them, part of our strategy is going to look like engaging the community and letting them know what we're looking to do, what the services are going to look like. So after we identify some spaces, that's uh, it's a community engagement strategy. Um, but again, we have not had any success when it comes down to surplus schools, mainly because of the condition. And the other item about it is we're not only just looking for space, it matters how accessible it is to other items as well. It also matters what else I can put on a location. So if I'm looking at a family location, childcare needs to be a part of it. I need to be able to have workforce development if it's a men's location. So we're not just looking for buildings, we're also looking for space that's gonna allow us a better model. Right. Uh, thank you very much for um, letting us know your vision for that and how that would, would work. I think it makes sense to have sort of a more comprehensive way. And I would imagine that within your vision of having workforce, but there's also the mental health, the other pieces that yes. are necessary. Um, the other question that I had was um, around, I have two more, well, three more. The flex fund. Um, I know that there were some of my constituents that had trouble accessing the funds there. And I guess I thought that flex could mean that it, there's a little bit more discretion um, by the department as to income levels and, and things like that. Um, that didn't seem to be the case uh, where, um, you know, people who were just slightly above the normal quote unquote income levels that we have in terms of common income levels that we have to comply with. Uh, that still are, you know, day to day, still not being able to afford the rent, still, or had a medical issue and are running out of money or whatever. So, so could you tell us a little bit more about those qualifications for the flex funds? Um, and is that program still moving forward, or you've got, you've, you've extended the funds? That project has completely expended all of its I, available I would imagine, funds. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the way that it was designed is. It, I believe we followed a 50% of AMI, so it was a little bit more than what standard for MOHS projects are always 30% and below the AMI. That project, I believe, was at 50% of the AMI, and so although it's a little bit higher, we, we absolutely saw people that were still struggling that was above the AMI and ineligible for the flex funds. It's always trying to find this balance of when you're creating these projects with the eligibility criteria. Yeah, oh, thank you for that clarity around the 50%. Um, the other thing that has come to us is, uh, this is very recent, and I, don't, I have not had a chance to email you about it. Um, there are uh, people who are coming through our city uh, who are, just need a place for one or two days as they are passing through. And uh, this has not been, this has been, I've heard it from two different angles. One was from the immigrant community, where folks are coming through, they want to get to a family in another city, and they, um, and then there's, you know, other other couples that are not immigrants that are, you know, coming through, and they're homeless. They can't afford a hotel, uh, and they provide, they ask for our services and are denied, um, and because there's a 45-day rule. Um, can you tell me where that rule comes from? And and the the re and I I understand if it's like 
you have to be a, a resident for 45 days in the city to per receive services from the city, right? I mean, logically that makes sense. But from a, can we help more people so that maybe they'll actually stay and be a part of our community sense, it, I'm just kind of wondering about where that 45 day residency rule comes in. I think that this, this came to me also this week also from, a, from another person as well. I'm not sure where the 45 day rule came from, but I completely agree with the 45 day rule in being able to establish residency. We currently turn away in the month of October, we turned away 1,053 Baltimore City residents that was asking for shelter. So when you look at resources and what we have available, um, I can certainly understand. I wasn't here when the city, when our agency came up with it, but also the way that HUD determines funds also is with your geographical location. So Baltimore City has a geographical location, and as such, anyone that we put in our system, I don't, I don't, the, the right word for it would not be it counts. However, you're only able to talk about those that are in your geographical code. So when we're talking to HUD about who are we serving, it's really focused on Baltimore City residents. So if someone was coming out in our system that's not from the city, and we look at who are you serving, from a, from a federal funds and lens of these dollars are earmarked for Baltimore City, those persons would not be eligible for those dollars and those programs because they are not Baltimore, from Baltimore City. Uh, yeah, I actually heard this initially from the immigrant community and I thought, well, maybe that's why. But then I heard it from another source that was not the immigrant community. So I figured it was a policy decision that we've made or comes from the funding. Um, and, and I understand that. And of course, you just said that we ended up having to, we, the city ended up having to um, turn people away because we didn't have enough shelter beds, as you said. So I, I get that. We, I think we need a solution in some way, whether it's working with a, one of our nonprofits that, you know, depending on how many we're actually talking about, which I think we can have a conversation with Esperanza Center and a few others to kind of figure out how many we're talking about to be able to have a, um, you know, a comprehensive strategy around, around that. But I, I understand. I just, you know, would be curious if it's, it sounds like it's just HUD funding. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one question. It's not a huge um, budget item. I'm just curious about um, the casino support for homeless strategies. Can you talk a little bit about that? It supports outreach. It's, it's one of the items that helps us support maybe one person that's a part of the outreach team. Is it targeted specifically in a casino area or how? More than likely, um, I'd have to look at it, but it's it's really about, it, it helps to pay for one of the outreach members, and I'm sure that person is working in that district as well. Got it, and I know that we have, um, no one has signed up to testify in person. I don't see anybody online who signed up to testify. Um, Councilman Ramos, did you have any additional questions? Yeah, I have another one. Uh, all right. But I got another one. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for the outline on um, how you know you, you've performed actually 22 resolutions in a year is actually pretty substantial um, given how, how dramatic the one that we did in my district was and, and necessary um, and it's true that um, you know all of them except for one are still I think in the in well two are in the um, in the system being being held and so that is, really good, um, although the others are, are getting services. So um, I guess my question is, there are still some out there that you're still in the process of trying to figure out whether or not there will be a resolution, uh, I would imagine. And um, are we doing those based on um, the availability of space first before we're actually going in, I would imagine, because we want to, I think all of us on the council would rather have folks, if we're going to do resolution, make sure that they're actually getting housed. Absolutely. That's the, that's the number one criteria. If we don't have the shelter beds, then we cannot do a resolution. So as the, the team strategy is, they start to engage 30 day in advance, but that team also starts to look and make sure that there are shelter space available. So that is a part of their protocol. 
So um, even without, uh, I guess I'm trying to understand also, what are we doing? How do we help uh, those that just do not want to get services? They do not want to get help. They've got, there are, there is shelter for them. There is a hotel room for them. We, we have worked together on a couple in particular, uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, cases in particular, and, they, and, and, and they're just not there yet to be able to accept. Um, what, how are we doing that? And I'm sure that's part of the stats you have prov provided, but also, um, you know, other than a resolution, is, is there any other situation where we can, where we can help make sure that that, that I, I really don't want to go through another winter with folks out on the street. That's the other thing. What we're trying to do is just engage, engage, engage. So we've added on, um, BCRI is going to also start working alongside our teams for those that we're just trying to engage. If for some reason it, it, we're just not having very much luck or success, so we're adding them onto our team um, to be a part of when we're reaching out and just not having success. And hopefully maybe that team can have a social worker or something like that um, join in on our outreach teams. The other thing we're trying to do is on our ACES project, I talked a little bit about it. It's a case management program. Um, what we're looking as a possibility of using some of the ACES slots for intensive case management services and support for those that are on the street. The other item um, that, that I talked a little bit about is DHCD State has awarded us $2 million and we plan to use those dollars that are really gonna focus on those that are chronically homeless and that are on the street. So I think we're trying to find um, additional funding, additional support that's going to allow us to have a targeted intervention. But as such, I, I truly believe in my heart that our, our goal is to make sure we're providing enough options so people have choice. So at the end of the day, I just want the city to make sure that we're doing our part. And hopefully when someone is ready to say yes, that we have the resources, the space to welcome them with the yes. But there are going to be some that just decline um, and I think that our outreach teams and our agencies just have to position ourselves to have units, to have shelter space, so that that data they say yes, there's a space for them to actually go to. One more question um, around um, the grants. So again, I know you have what over 150 contracts per year. Have you had to end any relationships, amend them? What, is, what does that look like too? Ask me the question one more time. In, in terms of the subrecipients, the contractors, the people, the, the entities you work with, have there been some that you've had to then sever ties with, make a, a changes to? This year, not since I've been here. We have, we have not since I've been here. However, as we continue to look at projects and look at compliance and look at spend, that might be something that we end up having to do in, in the future, but it has not been something that we've had to do this past year. Well, look, we really do appreciate the work you're doing. As you can tell from the questions, again, it's a, it's a very important issue area. I know there are people in our district that are looking for, for funds, for housing, and we know it's not easy. Um, also, just dealing with the conditions that our, our people are dealing with, whether they be families or seniors or young people. Um, so again, it, it's very important work, but we do thank you for uh, a steady hand. Uh, we also appreciate um, the vision and look forward to seeing uh, continued progress on this front. So. So again, thank you for, for being here. And let us know how we can help. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you both very much. Thank you all. All right. So with that, we will stand adjourned. Enjoy the rest of the day. You too.